so I guess it's time to start, and uh, just in the nick of time, you know, with uh, the usual technical difficulties. But uh, we're past all that now, and so for the first thing, I'd like to announce to all the students who are here and are supposed to sign in and get the credit for their coursework that some of us guys that have the PE license or registered are registered professional engineers can also benefit from coming up and signing up after the uh, meeting uh, because we have now prepared uh, a, a, a little sheet which describes the meeting and uh, has the appropriate certification so that we can do it because all of us have to get these 15 hours every year and so that's available so those of you that would like that come forward we'll have the uh, 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 sheets here for that to be done and so thank you for your indulgence here professor Malik Obelek received his BSc with honors from the University of Khartoum in 1976, his SM, EE, and DSC degrees in electrical engineering from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in 1980, 81, and 86, respectively. He's a registered professional engineer in the state of Ohio and a senior member of the IEEE. He is active in several IEEE societies related to power and power electronics. He has organized and chaired many conferences, sessions in these societies, and has served as the editor of their transactions. Presently, Professor El Elbelek is professor of EECS at the University of, University of Akron, where he has developed an excellent curriculum in power, for power electronics. He and his colleagues have developed and teach over five courses in this area. We welcome Dr. Elbelek, who has graciously agreed to share with us his insight into research and curriculum development in this area. Thank, Thank you, you, Bill. I'm glad to be here. I hope uh, this will uh, highlight uh, pretty much our experience in developing uh, a power electronics program at the University of Akron. And I, I guess I wanted to acknowledge uh, one of my uh, professors in the back, Steve Humans, mm -hmm. taught me two courses in power systems at, at MIT in, uh, in the early 80s. And he probably would have some input to also talk about the evolution of uh, power systems and power electronics throughout the years. So what I wanted to share with you is what, uh, what we have came up with uh, in terms of power electronics uh, <coughs> program at the University of Akron. Uh, that program, I started the program in uh, 1989 when I joined the university. And I, I found out the difficulties, some of the difficulties at least that uh, faces uh, the transitional between power systems, power electronics, electric machines, and all of these areas. And when Bill called me um, some time ago and, and he asked just about what type of uh, textbooks that would suggest and what course uh, would teach, or at, at least at the beginning, I gave him the textbooks and then he later called me again. He said, I got the textbook, but they contains a lot. Maybe we could talk more. And then uh, he talked me into maybe could I come and uh, speak to the faculty and, and the students about the curriculum development in terms of power electronics. So that's what I'm going to share with you. It's very informal, so if there's anything that you wanted to ask ab about in the middle of the talk, please feel uh, so. And um, I will make it short, too, so that it doesn't become too boring. Uh, <coughs> I will talk about the power electronic discipline I will talk about the power electronics program at the University of Akron and the, the philosophy and how we, we went about developing it. I'll talk about the laboratory because I think laboratory is something that is connected to power electronics because power electronics is a very practical field. And then I will talk a little bit about a graduate program and then some concluding remarks. Everybody is hearing me? All right. This here is, a, a, it used to be a triangle, but uh, one of the textbooks by Rashid uh, made it in, in form of a, a thyristor, which is the uh, device that uh, started power electronics, which is what's known as second revolution in power electronics. Uh, that is the invention of the thyristor. Uh, I guess the first revolution in the 48, 48 when they invented the signal level transistor. But uh, Dr. William Newell of Westinghouse uh, I, uh, is one of the first pioneers in, in, in power electronics. And uh, he tried to uh, define the, 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 the field of power electronics or the discipline of power electronics. So he, he said that it, it contains three areas, control with the analog and digital part of it, electronics with the devices and circuits, 
and power with the static like tra uh, transformers and rotating machines. But uh, this has also expanded over the years quite a bit. There is another diagram that, uh, that goes along this by uh, some Japanese uh, professor, but uh, shows that the power electronics is a multidisciplinary uh, field and uh, at least it shares controlled electronics and power. So if, if you think about it, is it that I put it from a system point of view, there are three ports, sort of a source, a load, and it can be bi-directional because both of them can be active. And in the middle is the power electronic system and then, or subsystem, and then some control system that control the uh, the power electronics. It is very much an interface of two electrical systems. So uh, in that case, uh, we know that there are two types of electricity, either AC or DC. So in, in, in brief, uh, this block here represents four types of what we call converters. Uh, AC to DC, which is, uh, takes the name of rectifier. DC to AC, which takes the name of an inverter. Uh, DC to DC, which makes the name of chopper in the, in the literature or in the uh, community of uh, motor drives. And it takes the name of a switching regulator in those who are doing power supplies. And then the last thing is AC controller or cycle converter, which is an AC to AC converter. Uh, so those are the, really the building blocks of, of the power electronics field and in, in all of the different applications uh, in which the field has uh, uh, spread. And so the power electronics constitute converters and electronic devices. And I think that is what uh, really made the field is that there are semiconductors uh, devices that were able to switch at very high level of voltage and current. And we are talking now about devices that can handle current in the kiloamps and, 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 and handle voltage in the hundreds of uh, 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 kilovolts or even more than that. So uh, that has really given the, uh, the, the, the field quite a bit of a spread to replace even some of the conventional uh, switches, like mechanical switches or hydraulic switches or pneumatic switches. So the field has replaced a lot of the conventional uh, uh, switching systems. Uh, it interface also alternative energy uh, uh, to the grid or to some standalone loads. And I think this is what is bringing now a lot of schools in the energy uh, era that these alternative energy are supposed to uh, come back and, 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 and maybe there is some hope that they will play a role into the uh, replacing the uh, fossil energy systems. But uh, the power electronics is essential to that uh, system. So it enables also the more electric upgrade of various technology vehicles. What I mean by that is replacing pneumatic, hydraulic actuators and, and other mechanical switches. And the, the survey says that maybe more than 90% uh, of energy convergence systems use power electronics to interface to their load or to the electric utility or to standalone uh, uh, sources. What's going on? Why this thing froze? Okay. The uh, power electronic devices are, are really the, 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 the heart of the converter. And uh, I want to just talk about them in general. I don't want to bore you with too much of them. There is, there is the type of controlled or uncontrolled devices like diodes, thyristors, triaxis are sort of semi-controlled. I should have put semi-controlled here and then uncontrolled here, which is the diodes. And then the fully controlled uh, switches, like uh, some of them are the transistor family, like the bipolar junction transistor, the insulated gate bipolar transistor, which is really sort of the, uh, the switch on the rise that has replaced or, 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 or uh, uh, pull, uh, <coughs> push, back, push away a lot of these uh, other switches. So the power MOSFET is, uh, is another switch that is really dominating the, the low power, high frequency, uh, static induction transistor. On the thyristor family, there is a mass control thyristor, the, the GTO, static induction thyristor. Those are high power devices. The thyristor is a low frequency 
high power device, whereas the IGBT is kind of a medium, uh, medium frequency, and the MOSFET is the high frequency, uh, low power uh, device. But uh, the, these devices actually, the implementation of the, these devices into the circuit uh, can, uh, can <coughs> make different applications, whether it's an AC to DC, DC to DC, and also the power flow. Now, the power electronic converters, uh, of course, the source can be voltage fed, current fed, and then throughout the years there were, because of the switching, you wanted to, the device to act as an ideal switch, an ideal switch that it is, when it is on, it has zero voltage across it, but it carry current, and when it is off, it, it has zero uh, current through it, but it, it support voltage. So if it's ideal, then it's really have to, uh, although it sees an average voltage and an average current, but on the power, because the instantaneous power is zero throughout, it doesn't see any average power. That's a common mistake that the students always make because the, the, the power is the average of the product of voltage and current, so, but the average of the product is not the product of the average. So that is uh, the ideal switch. So, but the, in, in the, there is nothing ideal Ideal makes, makes it easier to teach it to the student, but then in reality there are limitations and the device is non-ideal, and in that case then there is power dissipation, and that power dissipation limit the, the, the voltage and current and also limit the frequency at which you can switch. So in that, uh, things went from what we call hard switching, uh, PWM or snubber, uh, and, and a snubber sort of uh, trying to bring the device with, within what we call the safe operating area. And uh, there were some lossy snubbers and, and lossless snubbers that took quite a bit of research. Then the soft switching is what uh, recently have pushed the, 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 the frequency and power level to higher levels because the loss is not as much. And uh, people talk about zero voltage switching, zero current switching, and actually, that could be through DC resonant link or AC resonant link, and resonant circuits have played a role into these zero switching converters. Now, another field that has uh, uh, been uh, really enhanced by the uh, power electronics is the electric motor drives. And uh, I, I, this is a, a source, it can interface a motor, which the motor can be an AC or a DC motor, and that means to talk about DC drives or, or AC drives, and that constitute what the converter is, depending on whether the source is AC or DC. So again, you can teach all of the power converter within the, the motor drive course. And uh, again, there are sensors, uh, mechanical sensors, electrical sensors, and other uh, variables to, to the control system, and some command signals to be followed that will dictate how you, you perform the switching functions in the power electronic. So I looked at the, at the uh, motor drive as a control technology which combines with newborn power electronic circuits with the traditional device such as motors and transformers. And I think that was, have been a key area to the success of power electronics and also to the enhancement of, of, of the power system field because I, I guess when I, uh, when I came to graduate school, uh, I guess the power systems is still existing and the research was there, that's where I took the two courses in power system one, power system two with Steve. But then a few years later, uh, MIT just got rid completely of their power system program and I guess maybe because of the research, but not that, all of other schools. So that has sort of made a dip into the progress of the power area but uh, the power electronics at that time is not really completely linked with power system. They're sort of two distinct areas, but uh, now they are emerging together as the power area, and I think that is the, the motor drive has, has played a role in, in combining those two areas together. Uh, did I skip? All right. Now, the energy convergence, I just wanted to show that these are pretty much with respect to what's going on today in terms of some of the alternative energy systems, uh, the non-fossil systems or the fossil systems, if you look at it, you can take any route and eventually either you convert through some thermal to mechanical to electrical and then through power electronics to interface to electricals and then 
through motor drives, which is also power electronics to mechanical, or things like wind, you go through power electronics to go to generation directly, or things like solar, you can go through uh, uh, power electronics to go to electrical, or you can go through thermal and back to electrical. Fuel cells also can go through uh, uh, mechanical or can go through power electronics to electrical. But here, what I wanted to say is that power electronics is a key to the success of alternative or distributed or renewable energy conversion. Those are all uh, uh, words that are used uh, with respect to this energy era. Uh, the renewable energy, I guess, uh, this diagram I pulled it from uh, a renewable energy in power systems, uh, and uh, pretty much everything goes back to the sun, and I guess that's why it's renewable, uh, whether thermal or photovoltaic or hydropower or wind or biofuels or tidal or geothermal, and actually it is an amazing amount of power, but I don't know how much is the efficiency to pull it, but you're talking in the... Uh, terawatts, so that is 10 to the, what's that, 10 to the 9, uh, no, 10 to the 9, or 10 to the 15, 12, 12, all right, so that's a lot of power. <laughs> now, uh, the distributed energy uh, resources is something that is now uh, on the rise, which is characterized by small generating technologies, which may include energy storage and management located close to the customers, and then they are connected to the grid. So, and then they utilize resources such as fuel cells, photovoltaic, wind, and natural gas. Uh, no specific uh, range or size of these, but they can range from a few hundred watts to megawatts, and uh, they uh, uh, operate at a low distribution voltage level. And uh, the implementation, can be as simple as setting a backup electric generator uh, or to a complex power generation system with the storage and energy management and so forth that's connected to the grid. And there is a growing interest in that area, especially with the uh, foreseeable shortage of uh, fuel, fossil fuel energy. Uh, this, uh, uh, I pulled this out of the National Renewable Energy Laboratory and uh, it shows all of these distributed energy sources connected through power electronics to the grid or to some standalone uh, loads. Uh, here is uh, just a simple example where power electronics is connected through both voltaic, a DC to DC converted with maximum power trans, uh, uh, tracking, uh, and then some energy storage. And this is a system that had been there for a while, people call it utility interface inverters, in which uh, the customers are plugged into the wall, and they can supply their own house or they can store the energy, use it in the evening when the sun goes away or sell it to the grid and get it back. So there's quite a bit of power electronics involved in that block diagram. And uh, this is another uh, aerospace power system configuration in which the solar energy also goes through different power converters and control system to different AC and DC loads. And I guess with the uh, green industrialization and renewable energy, uh, there is quite a bit of uh, issues in which power electronics will play a big role into this uh, secure and re reliable energy and also clean power generation. Now, with that, I, I just wanted to give a, an introduction to what power electronics or where does it get into in the different areas. I wanted to get into the program, which is uh, what uh, Bill uh, asked me to talk about. And, and I think uh, from my experience, I don't think this is, uh, I would make, make this as a standard, but that is the experience that we went through at the University of Akron, is that in my opinion, a comprehensive program in power electronics should reflect the interdisciplinary nature of the field and should cover a wide range of electrical energy from several watts in a switch mode power supplies that's in your laptop to megawatts in uh, motor drives and un uninterruptible power supplies, UPS. And it has a lot of application in power supplies, electrical machines and motor drives, uh, power system interconnections and power quality, the issue of harmonics injected by power electronics into power systems and alternative energy sources, whether they're connected to the grid or through the standalone. 
if now wanted to make a curriculum along these lines, there's quite a bit of a stuff to be, uh, to be followed, and, 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 and that might make it harder to, to, uh, <coughs> to put these courses. At the University of Akron, what we did is uh, we divide the courses into three levels. What we call required undergraduate courses, and we offer two courses at the junior level. These are the students that stud courses that the students have to take. One of them is the traditional uh, energy conversion or electric machines, and this formed the base for the theoretical and experimental understanding of the classical electrical machines and transformers. I also introduced the power electronics as building blocks. Not a lot of detail into what the converter does, but what is the functionality in terms of the motor drives, uh, say the control of torque speed characteristics, the DC motor, AC motor. So it gives the students a little bit of excitement that electronics is there because somehow uh, the, the students feel that the word power is old and, and, and their electronics is, but uh, I, I attended one time a, a, a teaching uh, workshop in which that uh, there was a session, we spent an hour trying to, to see if we can change the name of power electronics to something that's more exciting, uh, 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 to remove the word power, but then uh, at the end uh, we, we came back to power electronics. So I think it's going to stay because uh, a group of people sa <coughs> sat on this for a long time and didn't find a better name. But uh, I guess there's no escape of the word power, but the electronics is there. But also, it gives the students an introduction to the area of power and, uh, and form a prerequisite to a number of higher undergraduate and graduate courses. So a number of schools cannot offer this even as a, as a, a required course. The curriculum is so jammed that they, they have to offer it as a senior elective, like I know uh, at the University of Minnesota, Ned Muhan, who has been running workshops for about over 15 years, trying to uh, get into what courses should be taught in power electronics motor drives and never uh, settle in anything yet. So I don't know where this thing is going to end. But he tells me that their, their power electronics course, which is one course that covers motor drives, electric machines, and power electronics, it's a senior level course. And there is close to 100 students taking it, because that is the only course that exposes them to power electronics, motor drives, and power systems, and all of the power area. At least at the University of Akron, we were glad that we were able to, to get that course. It also has a lab associated with it. And, and, and the lab, actually, we, we, we updated that lab. Reliance uh, gave us a complete uh, laboratory with all of the AC drives and the DC drives. So that's also uh, got the students a little bit more uh, uh, exposure to what power electronics can do. Uh, the transitional courses, I call them 400, 500 level. And those are courses we offer that are either, either senior electives to undergraduates or to uh, uh, first year graduate students. And again, because power electronics may not be offered at all the schools, uh, some graduate students will come into the program with no any knowledge about power electronics. So in that regard, we, they, they get a 500 level credit for that. Uh, and uh, <coughs> It gives the students more in-depth understanding of the uh, three distinct area of power, these, the three courses, uh, namely power electronics, electric motor drives, and power systems. So we have three courses that are 400, 500 level. One in power systems, and uh, it used to be called power system analysis, and we call it modern power systems. So it's the same course, but we added the word modern to it. <laughs> we call it modern power systems. So, uh, and then, uh, Again, as I said, because a number of schools do not offer courses in power area, those will act as a foundation to graduate students getting into that. And um, the, the, to differentiate between the 400 and 500, we give the graduate student either a different test or we give them a, a, a project that they have to do at the end because uh, the undergraduate may feel a little bit uh, at a disadvantage. Uh, this is. Uh, I will scan through it fast. These are the two courses, the energy conversion course and the laboratory. We used to run the course and the lab in one, and that was hard. And uh, then we, we, uh, we went and separated them. So they take the course in one semester, and they take the course, the lab in the next semester. And then 
the curriculum jammed us again, so we were back to teaching the course, uh, in, at, at, at the, uh, both of them together, but we teach the course for about four or five weeks, and then the lab starts a little later, so that is where we are now. But uh, here we offer Power Electronics One, which is a basic uh, um, uh, converter. We offer modern power systems. We had a course in electric and, uh, and hybrid vehicles because that's a design project. And uh, we, we, uh, uh, <coughs> we compete in a number of competition. One of them is Challenge X, uh, which is a three-year program uh, in, uh, in hybrid vehicles that was run by General Motor. And then we uh, uh, have the electric motor drives. We had a, 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 a laboratory associated with both of those and uh, there was a, an enrollment issue that I will talk about, that is these courses, uh, Bill was asking me before we, we started, what are the number? I think our courses used to be around 35 students, and uh, now they, they can range from as high as 25 to as low as 10 uh, students uh, per course. But the, these are design projects in which that uh, we give the students uh, uh, some projects rather than uh, the conventional laboratory because it's just difficult to do it with power electronics. You cannot do it the same as you do uh, a laboratory in, in, uh, in uh, electric circuits or uh, a signal level uh, uh, electronics uh, uh, like uh, <coughs> electronics amplifier. And then these are our graduate level courses. We had one, Power Electronics 2 is really a course that deal with the, with the same as Power Electronics 1, except uh, it deals with the non-ideality of the things, uh, the, the ideality of the devices, the non-ideality of, uh, of the components, uh, and then the, uh, the uh, other issues like the gate drives and the, uh, and the commutation techniques for thyristors. So that is a, a course that requires a little more uh, tedious understanding of the impact of the components on the power circuit, where here the components are treated as ideal and, and the emphasis is in the form and function of the, of the power circuit. Uh, yes? What are the prerequisites of this first course? Uh, this course here? The energy conversion, the prerequisite for it is, is uh, uh, circuits. And uh, the, the power electronics, the, the prerequisite for it is, is really circuits too, which is if the students are familiar with, we have two circuit sequence, circuit one, which is DC and AC circuit, circuits two, which is time domain and frequency domain analysis of circuits. We could do physical electronics, which is, goes into diode, what a diode, what a transistor, but really we, we deal with the switches here as ideal switches. The only time we, we, we wanted to get the diode in or the thyristor or the transistor is the implementation just so that the students know this is a rectifier, this is a DC to DC converter. That's it. So in that regard, they don't need to know more, but we introduce them to those components. Electromagnetic in the energy conversion, actually, we give them uh, a little bit about magnetic circuit, but the electromagnetics, although we, it, it is also a 300 level, we didn't want to make a 300 level course to be a prerequisite for a 300, but they are, they are co co, we we'll call them co prerequisite, so that they, they are offered in the same semester. So. No, no. I think it would be very hard to, to go to go below junior level. Really, I, I would not go that far. Really, because uh, and and then the graduate level. Uh, so, <laughs> dynamics and control of power electronic circuit is a unique, because really there is a transfer function associated with that converter due to whatever the inputs and so forth. And uh, I, the only book that really treated. Uh, this topic is uh, a book by uh, people from MIT, Kasachian, Schlecht, and Verghese, uh, in which uh, they really devoted a number of chapters for this, because most of this material is really in the research, and there's a lot of it in, in terms of uh, papers. Uh, we teach also a course in dynamics of electric machines. I guess Steve knows a lot more about that. Uh, uh, we use a book, uh, I will talk about textbook, 
Then we use control of machines. This is more of uh, the, 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 the transfer function and the dynamics of the machine. This is more of the closing the loop. And then we have, of course, in power semiconductor devices. And uh, uh, those who are in semiconductor know that the, the um, just one theme in terms of power uh, uh, of uh, electronics uh, switches or electronics semiconductor switches or semiconductor devices is that the signal level operate, which is known as low level injection, and these operate at high level injection uh, 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 conduct mobile, uh, conductivity modulated uh, regions and other uh, different issues that characterize the power devices different from the signal level device. In this advanced motor controls, this was taught once or twice in which we do things like finite element analysis, design of electric machines, and uh, that we share with the, with the electromagnetics people. So <coughs> the, um, that is the program, but we really suffered a lot of enrollment issues. Uh, especially when computer engineering came, the, the, we, we, we had a, a, a resistance in terms of power is not part of computer engineering, again, because of the word power. And we tried to, uh, I told them, okay, let's, let's teach a course like computer peripherals, in which we talk about disk drives, we talk about the power supply, but still it didn't fly, but uh, uh, at least I fought it. Uh, but in my opinion, uh, we may not be able, and my suggestion is that for, uh, for with, the, with the curriculum being jammed and EBIT saying that it has to be 128 and not to exceed to certain, then you have, can only offer so much. So in that regard, maybe you may want it to look into advanced or integrated uh, approach in which that you, it becomes complicated because it requires quite a bit of background, but it will attract uh, more students. And I just gave some examples, not necessarily all of them like mechatronics or robotics, computer peripherals, real-time computing because you use a lot of uh, signal uh, DSB applications and microcontrollers. Uh, power system interconnection because the effect of harmonics on power systems. And that's a course that people who work with the utility, first energy, or high Edison uh, will like that course. Uh, hybrid and electric vehicles uh, or even transportation in general, that is another course. Uh, alternative energy systems, that is a, another difficult course because it's also multidisciplinary. If you talk about fuel cells, you want some people who are electrochemical based and also uh, 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 electrical uh, base. So, but these are, are courses that will attract students from other engineering disciplines. The problem that I see is that you won't be able to find a textbook unless you, you make your own textbook as you grow up into the course. Uh, now, the laboratory, I think power electronics, uh, the, the students, uh, need the power electronics laboratory because really once they work they find that it's a very practical field. Everything that we teach them is really built somewhere outside there. So uh, it, it, it gives them uh, an, a, <coughs> an opportunity to put together uh, courses from circuit theory, signal analysis, magnetic analysis, digital systems, analog electronics and control systems. And that's really the, the beauty of the lab, but it, it, it's not, that's why you cannot put it as a regular experimental experiment and connect the circuit as shown and so forth. It cannot be done that way. So what we did, a conventional approach is not really workable. And uh, uh, we, we do a design and, and <coughs> what we call a design-oriented power electronics laboratory. We give them a refresher project, and, and, and what I did was uh, I got a, a kit that does a, a light dimmer, so they give them the parts, and they connect that circuit, and then they take measurement, they, the input, they look at the, the output, they see the, the chopping, and then they, 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 they do a, a Fourier analysis, they get the waveform. So I at least introduce them to some of the issues. That is sort of... Uh, 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 done for them, but they have to do the extra work associated with the measurement and the building uh, and testing of the circuit. And then we give them actually three to four weeks design projects. And, and the way I did it, I, I give them an AC to DC, then I give them a DC to DC, then I give them a DC to AC, 
and those are all connected together. It, it, it's a nice idea, but again, it is hard, and also uh, the students pretty much are also looking for a way out. So they are not going to, if you're going to <laughs> consume all their time, they're not going to take your course. And that's what we suffered in, in terms of that the enrollment went down because the course, although it benefited them, they like it, but it takes a lot of their time. So they're going to go take another three credit that is really maybe there is a homework or there is no homework. And uh, so that is, that is the problem that you face with the curriculum in that the equivalency in that the three level, a three credit course may take them a lot less time than another three credit course. And this is what we face with the, uh, with the uh, courses uh, in, the, uh, in the laboratory, in the power electronics and the motor drive. So what I end up is that because there was no enrollment, so those courses are there in the catalog, but they're not taught, but I, I, I give them a design project at the end of the power electronics course and a design project at the end of the, uh, of the motor drives, which is about 15, 10%, so you have to size it down, and also the students work in teams, so uh, depending on. Uh, but I think they like it, and um, they, they, uh, the issues addressed is the non-ideality of components, again, because there is no ideal switch, so they have to live with the, the, the switch get very hot to the extent that they cannot touch it, or it blows, or the, the, the heat sinking, and uh, the short circuiting, a lot of these issues are there. The, the control circuit is something that we don't teach. We don't teach them the control circuit. We teach them the switches on and off and give them a timing diagram, but we don't teach them how you implement it and it, uh, all of the digital stuff. In that case, that's the only thing that they can get into, in the lab. Uh, and then the, the, the control, whether open loop, closed loop, we don't teach that again in the power electronics course. But again, it's something that if they have the interest, although I do not enforce the closed loop because I don't do the modeling or the transfer function, so in that case, it, it, it's unfair. But the open loop, uh, you just, uh, that is easy for them to do. And then the real-time computation, if they wanted to do microcontroller or DSP. Backward. Yeah, uh, so let me, they do uh, uh, design component selection. Uh, they simulate either in PSPICE or MATLAB simulating. Those are the two available to us through the, the, the department. They do the circuit layout and, and how to reduce noise and, and get things to switch. And then the uh, testing and debugging. And, and there is a lot involved in that. And actually, I found that to turn one transistor, it gives the students a lot of hard time to get that transistor turned on. So it's not as easy as really we turn it on in, in, in the classroom. Uh, and uh, the, these courses bridge the gap between the ideal approach taken in the, in the course or the theory in the academia and the non-ideal situation which what they face when they go into the industry uh, after their graduation. So we did uh, those and we have the energy conversion that is at least offered to us as part of the uh, required courses. And we had one power electronics and one motor drive, but as I said, the, the enrollment has really gone down. The textbook is the problem because it's difficult to find a textbook that will completely address the needs in a specific course. That is general, but uh, one textbook is used. We use one textbook and, and supplement that with notes. Uh, there are a number of power electronics books available in the market, but they really follow an approach that better fits into graduate courses than undergraduate courses. I get uh, Bill, I gave him about three or four courses, four books that at least the one that could be easy in the undergraduate. And um, the, uh, these courses, this, the textbooks, the students taking this course, they really find that, that these textbooks in undergraduate very hard, especially when they try to come and solve the homework problems. So in my opinion, I have never seen this happen yet, but I don't know. There is a need for two introductory textbooks that are basic and simple, uh, especially with, uh, to, if you wanted to, to get the courses offered and compete with other courses, you have to have a, 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 a textbook. One is Introduction to Power Electronics, which addresses those basic converters with some uh, a background needed like circuit theory, differential equations, 
uh, and then uh, uh, signal analysis, Fourier and harmonic analysis. So that is uh, the textbook in, in power electronics. The other is in motor drives, and I think there is one in power electronics, or that at least there are some in power electronics that get close to the introduction. But the motor drives actually, because there aren't too many schools that are offering the course, and also uh, that there used to be what the, the textbooks that I use is out of print, uh, done by um, a professor who passed away from India, Duby, power semiconductor control drives. Uh, I guess the, the, the publishers, once a book doesn't sell, they really have to put it out of print. So that, but at least uh, it is, I can use it. And, and that one in motor drives. And then, in my opinion, it would be nice if there is a, a series of, rather than one textbook that has 25 chapters on it, like Mohan or Kasakian or, or Rashid, it contains power electronics, non-ideality, and the motor drives, and the uh, semiconductor devices, and the, uh, the modeling and control. It might be, it, it, again, it needs a committee to go into having books that deal with these different in a small package. Uh, uh, when I was uh, in graduate school, there is a series, I guess, Steve, uh, the, the one in semiconductor seek, or the, that's like a, a seven textbook. I thought that was a good idea. I guess power electronics needs something like that. Uh, it would be nice. These are the textbooks. Actually, I used all of these, and I experiment with all of them. Uh, in, in, uh, and, and, and still, I think that none of them has really gone along the, because some of them deal with non-ideal, some of them ideal, some of them address issues, and more, they're more into the device. Some of them are more into <laughs> application. So it is, it's difficult to, to find a textbook that, uh, that fit. Some of them are like Krauss. We use that for the dynamics of uh, electric machines. I forgot to add uh, Lipo and Novotny for uh, the control of machines. The graduate program, I think the course are more dedicated to research. And, and I wanted to give an example that my advisor at MIT was really upset that the students will graduate from Caltech and they don't know what a thyristor is, but Caltech was at that time very powerful in switching regulators. There were two professors who were teaching all of these switching regulators. They have done a lot of research, and they're, they're, all the courses are offered in terms of DC to DC converters, the, the circuits and the, and, the, and the modeling and the control and so forth. But the thyristor is not really used in DC to DC converters. But uh, I, I think, uh, for example, you see the courses in power electronics at Virginia Tech are more geared towards uh, uh, more of uh, distributed power supplies and also where are the courses at Wisconsin are more geared towards motor drives. And so you can, in a graduate program, you can have that flexibility, but you don't have that flexibility in the undergraduate. But anyway, the courses are dedicated to research areas and they, they could be converters for power supplies or DSP and microcontroller motion controls. We have done that. Intelligent, we worked a little bit with uh, fuzzy logic, neural network, and advanced control systems. Alternative energy, renewable distributed energy sources, resources, uh, application of power electronics, aerospace, automotive, and other transportation system. Electric machines and drives, that is uh, uh, an area where there's a lot there, AC drives, DC drives, although AC drives are phasing out DC drives. And the integration of power electronics in power systems. Actually, this is becoming now, uh, at the beginning, as I said, they were running as two parallel, and there is a lot of impact on power, electro uh, power electronics into power systems that the power systems people do not like. But now this has all uh, brought into a lot of interconnection and integration of those two things. Coming to the end, so I hope it didn't bore you. Uh, so, in, in concluding that power electronics is a key to the success of uh, motor drive, distributed energy source, resources, and applications in power supplies and transportation, a uh, comprehensive program in power electronics should reflect the interdisciplinary nature of the field and should uh, separate the courses from the research, at least so that uh, uh, it, it becomes a standard, uh, as I said, in graduate school, the courses are geared towards the research, so in that case, there is some sort of uh, uh, bias to a certain area. A series of textbooks in power electronics are needed to serve various courses. A design project-oriented approach will help better to teach power electronics laboratory. 
And there is a growing demand in schools in the US and even worldwide to establish power electronics to support programs in motor drive, power systems, and renewable energy solutions. And there is a, still a large gap between the university research and the current industry application in which I guess that gap uh, would probably early be closed through curriculum. Oops, thank you and uh, be glad to, if you have a comment or a question, I guess we took about 45 minutes or a little. Yes. <laughs> I'll try to keep it short. Yeah. Uh, which simulator do you use in the Power Electronics course? We use vSpice or MATLAB Simulink. Okay. There are a number available. There is one called uh, PSIM, and then there is another one by uh, what's the company in uh, in Bisberg that does finite element and soft. There is another one that's very expensive. That's uh, I guess. I, I saw it at NASA, but uh, NASA is willing to pay 20000 a year, but uh, it's a very expensive one. But it, 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 the nice about that one is can you make your own module, or you can add uh, uh, also it integrate another, all of the disciplines kind of thing. But the question is? Well, um, you mentioned MATLAB versus SPICE, and, and Bill showed me the two textbooks that you showed him, and, and there seemed to be a very different two different approaches, the top-down, starting at system, using MATLAB simulation, and, and the other book seemed to emphasize bottom-up, start with the devices. Then yeah, push. that is the problem. Do you have a, a favorite approach of the two? I would favor the start with the devices and not deep into them, and then get into the converters, and then get into the simulation. OK. And, and, and uh, I'll just ask one more question. Which major or majors are required to take those two undergrad courses? <coughs> the two undergrad courses are, are the, the electrical. We have electrical and computer. We couldn't get them to the computer to take them, so it is the electrical engineering. But at least better than not pushing them all the way. I, I, I saw a, 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 a struggle of the power system group at North Carolina State, where I taught for three years that they used to have a, a power system, introduction to power system course. Uh, and North Carolina used to be very strong in power systems. And that course is offered at the junior level. But the, the, the semiconductor, the electronics, not the power electronics people, constitute about 50% uh, of, uh, of the department phase that course out to the electives. So it, it's a battle. It's a battle. But the, the electrical engineering take the undergraduates, the, the electrical engineering uh, students. Thank you. Sure. Yes, Bill? I'm curious as to where the right cut is, because I remember as an undergraduate coming here a long, long time ago, uh, they were just phasing out, of course, some magnetic circuits. So I never had a benefit from that, but I did have a uh, motors course where we had real motors. I mean, the big kind that went from go up to go too fast. Uh, and, and so we, we learned some of those basics, but those things were phased out in favor of a more signals approach to, to electrical engineering. Now, my question really is, where is the right place to start in this present climate? We're having this big push back to energy as a focus, green energy, electrical energy conversion, smart grid, all of that stuff. What is sort of the minimum level of understanding that an electrical engineering undergraduate should have when he gets his uh, See, I don't think there is a one answer, but number one, you, you said a course in magnetic circuit. That, that is gone. You can't have, you, 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 you cannot, you, you cannot have, you have to, now you have to really sacrifice breadth for depth. Because magnetic circuit, a course in magnetic circuit, that is like a, a little bit of a course that covers so much stuff. So, Today's courses, there's a lot of breadth to them and maybe a little depth. And that is just because we wanted to expose the students before they leave. Now, as far as the minimum, it differs from school to school. There are some schools where really the required courses are very few. They have one course in circuits and electronics. They have one course in uh, computers. 
and they have one course in digital system or signals and systems, and then after that, it is electives and minor, minors and so forth. We at the University of Akron, I think we are lucky to force them to take a circuit one, a circuit two, an EM one, an EM two, uh, a signals and system, a physical electronics, electronic design, uh, control systems, introduction to communication, that is nine required courses plus the labs. So I guess it depends, uh, but our, the our emphasis is more in undergraduate. But when you go to the big schools like uh, MIT, uh, Caltech, uh, University of Minnesota, you will find that the department, the electrical engineering department at MIT is 130 faculty. They, you're talking about a broad spectrum of things. So to cover all of that, you have to take some minimum courses, and then after that you spread so that you give this uh, variety. But uh, it, it's difficult to, to, it depends on the, on the program. But I think there is, in my opinion, there, are, there is a minimum of four courses. A circuit course, a signals and systems course, uh, some sort of uh, uh, electromagnetic. Uh, MIT has a course that uh, used to be taught by uh, Professor Milcher, who passed away. It's called Field Forces and Motions, which combine all of that stuff uh, in, in, in one. And I think it's unique in that regard. And then uh, maybe a course that has to do with the digital systems and stuff like that. Those at least, I, 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 if I have to give an opinion in terms of what is the minimum, that would be my, uh, my say. Yes? Comment on uh, the appropriateness of modeling versus package uh, components, say a off-the-shelf motor drive versus component level design, and how you spread them out among the courses? I think that the, the, the packaging is, a, is, is an approach may, you have to, you have to have the right um, infrastructure. Like University of Minnesota is doing what you're talking, we call them uh, PEPs, power electronics modules or power electronics building blocks in which that you, you connect these building blocks to make the converter. And, and they, they, that worked over so many years and they have to develop these modules and all of that. Whereas if you don't have that, then you can't go with the packaging and the, the modules part, but you have to go with the discrete devices. And, but in my opinion, I prefer the discrete device part because it goes into the little details of things and, and there is no hidden uh, parts to the students. They know that is, that is the level of detail that they go. But it's sometimes it's hard. The, 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 the module one may be easy to integrate and, and, and maybe it's sometimes to achieve and maybe if the students can recover what is the details of the modules uh, by their own, then that is an approach, which maybe that is the approach that some schools are taking to do the lab, a lab environment rather than the design oriented project, where if you do a design oriented project, then you have to go to the, to the level of the discrete components. Someone, uh, yes? I once read, I think it was in one of the Power Engineering Society uh, uh, conferences, or something that over 50% of the energy conversion courses are actually taught by mechanical engineering departments rather than EE or ECE departments. Uh, how different are those kinds of courses? I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know about. Uh, I don't know about that statistic, but Steve may help me with that because he interacted with a lot of mechanical engineering. Because power system generation and energy conversion, especially, there's always some sort of a thermal thing that goes into a turbine. And but 50% is kind of high, isn't it? <laughs> Steve, what what do you say? Issues Absolutely. Even bigger than the, the ones that we talked about already. For example, you, you can study in electrical engineering about electric machines. You don't know nearly enough to ever make an electric machine that's going to work because you have to understand its thermal performance, you have to understand all sorts of uh, stress issues and all that sort of So the interdisciplinary is very important. <coughs> uh, if you put mechanical, chemical, I mean, uh, we have a. Uh, 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 
a group doing fuel cells, They're mainly in the chemical engineering. But really, to take it further, these fuel cells won't work until you get to the electrical engineering. And, and they, they are two separate things. So the interdisciplinary nature is, is essential, really. Somehow, that has to start somewhere. That's why I was asking Nate to start with the first energy conversion course, being a multidisciplinary engineering core course. Yeah, and, and I think that we, we, I personally thought of that, and I still think about it. But number, I faced a number is the textbook. And number two, number two, the depth, because you have uh, uh, students with different background and the prerequisite is different. So if you are going to teach it, then you have to tell them what a fuel cell is, what uh, 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 the, uh, the, the uh, windmill, the, and then you give them the basics. So from there, they can go into other courses. But that would be a good course. I mean, it's needed. I mean, even if it is uh, just a, a refresher or uh, something that introduced them, I think it, it will help. Yes, Steve. I was just going to make one other observation. Oh. You know, the issue of having labs, I think, is really important in, in the sense, for example, you're, you're interfacing motors with power electronics. And the motors don't look like the, the equations in the books. <laughs> and the, the motor people, you know, the, the, the drives are very complicated things. And the real world waveforms have a lot to do with losses, people care about efficiency and all that sort of thing. So the thinking about ways to get practical experience you know, is, is really important. Right? And I understand it's, it's tough. It's, it takes a lot of time. That's why I, wrote, why I wrote, if you think that there's a comment, I said the students, although the students are very frustrated with that course, with the lab course, that, but they feel that they, they, they learned a lot. So that is the the, the compromise that they're very frustrated, but at the end, they, they feel that they learn a lot, especially the ones that work. The ones that work, although they're frustrated, they think, now I got something in hand. Other questions? Well, thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>